James 1.27 says this, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their distress. Katie Davis Majors did just that. As a late teenager, she went to Uganda on a missions trip and ended up going back to adopt 13 Ugandan young ladies and became their mother. She's moved there from Nashville and she demonstrates what heroic faith looks like and also what pure religion looks like as well. This is a great story of courage. You're going to be impacted by it. Enjoy. As a single mother, a parent to 13 adopted children, Katie Davis Majors was surprised when a young man, also living in Uganda, began pursuing her. He asked me out twice, and it was in the middle of, I think, just a hard season for me personally. And both times I said no, and the second time I really said, like, firmly no, like, hey, like, don't ask again, I no. hope we can still be friends, but if we can't, it's okay. <laughs> we can't, we can't do that. I'm, no, no thank you. This is Family Life Today. Our host is Dennis Rainey, and I'm Bob Lapine. How Katie Majors went from a firm no to becoming Mrs. Benji Majors. We'll hear that story today. Stay with us. And welcome to Family Life Today. Thanks for joining us. I want to meet Benji Majors sometime, don't you? I do. (laughs) I mean, I just want to meet the guy who uh, was persistent and met a uh, a determined young woman and was determined to win her. I want to hear the story of whether or not he went to Uganda in search of Katie Davis, <laughs> author of Kisses from Katie. <laughs> uh, looking for some kisses? <laughs> and Is that what it was? Some kisses? was he looking for kisses when he found you? <laughs> Katie, here's what I... And Katie's back with us, and uh, your wife Barbara's back as yeah, well. Yeah, I think I failed to introduce her on an earlier broadcast. Sorry, sweetheart. Ah, uh, it's okay. <laughs> Katie, I, I, I'm just curious about Benji. You told us earlier that uh, there was a guy who was living out in the house behind your house, and, and you called Benji and said, would you want to come disciple him? And Benji said, sure. And I'm thinking... Yeah, Benji, who wanted to take you out, I'd have come and discipled him, said, I'll be there every day to disciple him <laughs> if it gets me a little closer to you. So you think that was in the back of his mind? Uh, at that point, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Are you sure, though? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a hesitant, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I well, Katie right. is the author of a new book, Daring to Hope. She uh, is now married to Benji, so he broke through, like you said, yeah. Bob. Yep. She is a mom of 14, 13 of whom, a baker's dozen of Ugandan little girls who are becoming, even against Katie's will, young ladies, <laughs> yeah. they're growing Isn't up. Isn't that true? Uh, growing up on her here. I want to ask you my favorite question, but I'm going to ask you to wait to answer it. Okay. Till the end of the broadcast. But I was recently in um, Bismarck, North Dakota, met a ton of listeners up there, including a young lady who started listening to Family Life Today when she was 13. Tell them about her. Yeah, her name is Amanda. And Amanda came up and said, I'm a listener to the broadcast. And I said, gosh, it's wonderful to meet you. And and she said, I started listening when I was 13. And I said, wow, did your mom and dad have the broadcast on and you just overheard them listening? And she said, well, occasionally, she said, but it was really me. I I knew when it was on and I would go back in my room and I would turn on the broadcast and I would listen by myself with the door shut. And I thought, oh, my goodness, a 13-year-old was going off and listening to Family Life Today on her own. And she said, now that I've been married for two years, I'm listening every day because now I really need it now that I'm married. (laughs) She was adorable. Well, I spoke at a men's luncheon, uh, Katie, and I asked the men the question I'm about to ask you. And a bunch of the men were radio listeners. And they all nodded their heads when I said, I'm going to have you guys all answer my favorite question. And uh, some of them said they already had the answer because they'd heard me mention it on the broadcast (laughs) before. Here's my question. What's the most courageous thing you've ever done in all of your life? Now, don't answer it right now. I want to give you a moment to think about it. But courage is, is doing your duty 
in the face of fear. Mm -hmm. And I've got a sneaking suspicion because of your book, Daring to Hope, that you've got a, a definition or two that comes from your book that you'd share with our listeners. But to get there, what I want to first have you do is tell us about uh, the woman who had five children who was uh, dying of TB and HIV who came to you. Her name was Catherine. Tell our listeners that story of how you cared for her. Catherine came to live with us when she became very ill. Her five children under the age of 10 were sponsored by Amazima, so we were paying for their school. Okay, let's just stop here. Amazima is an organization you run in Uganda. Yes, and we our goal is really to disciple families and to empower the families to stay together. So about 80% of children in institutions in East Africa actually have one living parent, and they end up institutionalized just to financial poverty. Their parents cannot afford to pay for them to go to school or to pay for their medical care or to pay for their food, and so they send them to these institutions, and that was something that was very shocking to me the first year that I lived in Uganda, and I really desired to try to change the system. And so through financial sponsorship, of school fees and some food and some basic medical provision. Amazima works to keep these children with their biological family members. But of course, the heartbeat of our organization is really that in doing that, we would form a relationship with these families and lead them to Christ. And Catherine was one of those moms who had experienced the care of your organization. Yes. So we were in relationship with her and had known her for a few years through her children. And she just got sicker and sicker to the point where she wasn't really able to take care of her children very well. So she moved over to our house so that I could help her out with her children. And also because our house is very close to the local hospital and she needed a little bit more immediate access to medical care. So we were just down the street from the doctor she was seeing. And so they lived with us for several months. And I truly, really believed that God was going to heal her of her illness, that she would become healthy and strong again. And, you know, I had imagined it in my head, the happy ending where she would move out with her children. And we always throw a bit of a celebration for people who have lived with us for a season and get to move out on their own again. We've had many families, especially struggling single mothers, live with us over the years. And we always have a big celebration when they become well or they finally find a job or their child is finally healthy enough and they can move out. And I really thought that that would be the case with Catherine and her family as well. And she did get better for some time, but then she began to deteriorate very quickly. And she passed away. She did. And you compared your experience to the prophet Habakkuk mm -hmm. and how he had to deal with some disappointments as well. But you learned through that disappointment that there isn't always a happy ending to the story. But in this case, there was a happy ending to the story because right. she went to heaven. Yes, absolutely. And that's what Habakkuk says, right? That though the olive crop mm -hmm. fails, though the leaves wither, though there are no sheep in the pen, basically, even if I can't see it, still I will hope, still I will rejoice in God my Savior. And I felt like that was something God was teaching me in a season where I had really thought we would see it. We would see a happy ending where she stayed alive. And God showed me, still I can rejoice, even though things didn't go my way. I remember discovering that verse when mm. our children were teenagers. And, mm. you know, they were starting to kind of press the limits a little bit and push back on us. And I discovered that verse. And I thought, this is a perfect verse for a mother. Yes. Of children of all ages, but especially teenagers. And I think the oldest was only 15 at the time. But I remember when I read that, I just hung on to that because I thought, Lord, there is no guarantee yes. that all the best parenting, all the prayer, mm -hmm. none of that guarantees that my children will choose you. They will choose to live a good life. They will be responsible. Mm -hmm. They'll be productive. There are no guarantees. It could all fail. It could all be gone. And will I trust you if you do that? And it was a real turning point in my life because I said, okay, God, I will. I will choose to believe you. Even if none of my children flourish, there is no green on the vine, as Habakkuk said. And I think that's a good 
that's just a good place for all of us to come to, to look at the possibility of it not happening the way we think it should, and mm-hmm. saying then at that point, can I still believe God? Can I still trust Him if it doesn't turn out the way I want to? And if you can, then you're in a good place because mm-hmm. your hope is firmly placed in Christ alone, yes. not in your children, not in your circumstances, not in anything other than Him. And that's where He wants us to be. And isn't that the hardest part of parenting? Oh, is just that moment when you realize... Even if I do everything perfectly, which I'm not. Which we're not. None <laughs> but of us even yeah. if I did, yes. there's no guarantee no. that there's going to be any fruit here. There's no mm-hmm. guarantee that these that they're going to choose Christ right. in their own lives, and they have to choose it for themselves. That's the scariest part of it, for sure. Yeah, exactly, because it's not something that we can do for them. No. Well, and, and Brian Loritz, who's a pastor in Northern California, who's a part of the Art of Parenting video series that's coming out before long, makes the observation, God is a perfect father. Mm-hmm. God has rebellious children. Yeah, lots yeah. of rebellious children. So yeah. <laughs> think about that. Here's a perfect father mm-hmm. with rebel kids. Why should we think that we as imperfect parents will be spared a little rebellion in our home, right? No right. doubt about it. And just as Barbara was talking about, we have learned a bunch about God's love for us as we have loved our kids and watched them struggle and their faith from time to time. And Katie, I know from reading your book that uh, you have learned a lot about the love of God through the, the 14 children that you have. Oh, absolutely, because even... You know, as a parent, you see so clearly that even when you're disciplining your children, it's it's not out of this place of anger toward them or hatred towards them. It's out of such this place of love and a desire for good things to come in their lives. And I think I've understood so much more that when God disciplines me in my own life, when God tells me to go in a direction that I don't really feel like I want to go, or when God even brings me through a difficult time that it is his love that does that to shape me, to change me, to teach me because he wants good things for me. And I think as parents, when we feel that love for our children, we can see it so much more clearly from God's vantage point. Yeah, I really agree. And and Katie, before we get too far away from the story of Catherine, uh, who died and her five children, what happened? to those five. Did you adopt them? (laughs) I didn't. They did stay with us for a little while immediately following her death. And then we placed them with a biological aunt who they lived with for some time. But that situation was never really good. The aunt was very young and she was also struggling. She didn't have any biological children, so she'd never parented before. And the children were really suffering there with her. We would provide food and we would drive out there to visit them. But It just never seemed to be a good situation. And so I was just getting desperate, just praying, asking the Lord what I should do. I mean, the idea of having five more children come to my house was a lot. (laughs) But at the same time— Did you have 14 at that point? I had 13. Yeah, I had all the girls at that point. At the same time, I was not clearly seeing another option. And they were a sibling set of five. Like, there aren't many families that are willing to take that on, even in the foster care system— in America, you see that it's much harder to place a large sibling set, which is understandable. And so I had gone to visit my friend, Rose, and I had gone to visit her about something else completely. She had a daughter, an older daughter, who was in our scholarship program. And so I went to talk to her about something. And before I started talking, she said, you know, my daughter— Helen, who had been a good friend of my daughter's and was in and out of our house a lot. She said, my daughter told me about what happened to the mom of those kids, and I'm so sorry, and God's just put it on my heart to really pray for them, but Hmm. also just to ask you, is there anything they need? Even Uh, maybe, uh, do do they need a place to go? So, of course, I, like, start to weep and just said, oh, I can't even tell you, like, That has been on my heart all week. I've been praying. I was even just telling a good friend of mine earlier that same day, like, I do not know what we're going to do for these children, but I feel like 
I told their mom before she died that I would make sure they were okay. That feels like a lot of responsibility. And so Rose and I talked for several more hours that day about what it would mean for her to start fostering them. And about a month later, we went through all the paperwork process and social workers visited with both families. And about a month later, we were able to help move Catherine's five children Mm -hmm. into Rose's home. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, I just marvel at your acts of courage Mm -hmm. to care for Catherine as she died, to care for her children after she died, and also your courage in developing a relationship with a young man Call Benji. Yeah, you talk about how unusual it is for somebody to take five kids in <laughs> as foster kids. <laughs> that is a little ironic, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, how it is. unusual is it for a young man to say, "I'm going to be the husband yeah. to a, a mom of 13"? Yeah, it's not. It's not usual. It's, it's not normal. <laughs> so he asked you out twice before you said yes. He did. He he asked me out twice, and it was in the middle of, I think, just a hard season for me personally. It was kind of in the midst of Mac coming to live with us, and then hmm. shortly after Mac moved out, Catherine and her family came to live with us. Shortly after Catherine died, another woman moved in with us who was also dying. Yeah, you know, i, I got to stop you for a moment. I, I wanted to ask you this question. What are, what's your house like? I mean— <laughs> How big is your house? How many bedrooms is your house? Five. Five bedrooms? Yeah. How many bathrooms? Three. Thirteen girls. Thirteen girls. Actually, fourteen, counting you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <That's> true. <laughs> yeah. But you do get your own bathroom out of that deal, don't you? Mm-hmm. I share with Benji and, you know, sometimes Noah and Patricia and Grace. <laughs> I'm sure the girls come in. Our bathroom was always a shared bathroom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So... To venture out in a relationship with this young man, back to what Bob said, it had to demand courage and a huge step of faith, even to entertain the possibility of a guy in your life, huh? Yeah, it was a big step for me, and it, it's a funny story because he did ask me out a couple of times, and both both times I said no, and the second time I really said like firmly no, like, hey, like, don't ask again, I no. hope we can still be friends, but if we can't, it's okay. <laughs> it was a John Deere, <laughs> But huh? like, we can't, we can't do that. I'm, no, no, thank you. And so then um, really after that, I think I got to watch his heart on display a lot more because I trusted that he wasn't going to ask me out again. He was very respectful in that. And so... He didn't really come over as much after that. He was still discipling a man that lived in the back of our yard, but he would come. He would go straight to Mac. He would spend his time with him, and he would leave. He would not come say hello to me. He would not try to Mm -hmm. make conversation. So, I mean, I felt very respected in that, that he didn't. He heard what I said, and he didn't push the boundaries, but I got to watch him and his heart for people and for service and truly for the gospel through that. He was also attending this large Bible study that we all went to on Wednesday nights, and he often led worship or even led the teaching at that Bible study. And um, I, I was just, I was so attracted to his heart for the Lord. And I was telling my good friend, like, oh my gosh, I think I like him. But now I can't tell him because he's never going to ask, <laughs> like, he's not going to ask me out again. There is no hope. So I did. I had to call him and ask him if he would come over for coffee, and he said no. (laughs) He didn't want to risk it again, huh? Well, yeah. I mean, I had said so clearly that I didn't want to date him. What was he going to be doing having coffee with me? Why would you have coffee with Uh a young single female that wasn't going to date you? (laughs) Yeah. So um, (laughs) I had to to beg and plead a little bit. Did you? Uh Uh-huh. And finally— Did you ever flirt? Oh, probably, yeah. And <laughs> and finally said, no, please, like, I really, I need to talk to you about something important. Can you come? Can we just, can we just have a cup of coffee? So he finally said yes. Oh, no, you got to say. And you said. You got, yeah, 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 yeah. What yeah. happened over the cup of coffee? Well, then I was so nervous because I, had I hadn't asked a guy out before. Come on. <laughs> so I was so nervous. So I made, like dumb small talk the whole time, right? And so after... Nervous. 
dumb, probably, right? Yes, just n- so nervous. And so after about an hour, he's looking at his watch and he's like, like okay, okay, well, this was nice. I think I'm going to go. So then I just kind of blurted out some words that probably didn't even make sense. Like, uh, you know, I was, um, I was thinking, I was wondering if maybe, do you want to like, we could spend more time together, you know, intentionally, you you know, yeah. <laughs> Real coherent, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> and he's just kind of looking at me. And finally he said, like, like dating? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, um, okay, I'm going to pray about that. And he left. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't go for the bait. And what I didn't know at the time, which is amazingly the Lord's provision and just further confirmation that we both really were trying to seek after him was that he had um, been in conversation earlier that week with some of his supporters in the States about whether or not his time in Uganda was coming to a close. Mm -hmm. He felt like he had pretty effectively discipled these 30 men, and they were all kind of going out into the world and starting churches and discipling other young men. And he felt like, okay, I I could kind of take under my wing another group, or I could just keep in touch with this group via Skype and internet. Maybe, maybe my time here is coming to a close. And so he had been in conversation with people about whether or not he was moving back when he got my phone call asking him to come to coffee. So what I didn't know when he said I need to pray about this was this was a much bigger decision than am I going to date this girl? Mm -hmm. This was a decision for him of is there more of life for me in Uganda right now? Mm. And so how long did you date? Probably almost a year from that point until we got engaged, and then we were engaged for about eight months. Time out. How did he propose Oh, it was so sweet. He he actually, he's such a good dad. He took all the girls out for ice cream earlier in the week. And he had just said to me, like, and he would do this sometimes. He would say, like, I'm going to take the girls out to eat or I'm going to take them down to the river to play for a little bit so that you can get some quiet. And so he had taken the girls out for ice cream and took them over to his house, actually, and sat them all down and said, I would like to propose to your mom. What do you think about that? And they they all gave feedback. And then he let them help him plan how oh. he would propose to me. And he That's showed so he sweet. showed them the ring. Oh, and he so let sweet. them he let it be a family affair, which I I just love that he knew my heart well enough to know that I would have felt like something was missing if they hadn't been a part of that. And so actually, our best friends came to babysit the girls. And and they did this frequently so that we could go out to dinner or something. And he took me back over to his place, and there was a picnic laid out. His yard's kind of right on the edge of the lake that we live nearby. And he proposed. And then as soon as I said yes, all our girls came running out of the bushes. They had watched the oh, whole how sweet. thing. Oh, I and, love and it. And they were so excited, and they had picked flowers, and they were throwing them on us. It was so sweet. So did anybody capture any photos of that? I hope. I just, no, I mean, I'm was, just thinking, oh, I wish I could have seen that. It just sounds yeah, I'd delightful. I'd make a great video. I know. Oh, it even was, just a few still photographs. It was but, so dark, but it's like seared in my memory I'm forever. I'm sure it is. So yeah. back to my original question at the beginning of the broadcast. Katie Davis Majors, what's the most courageous thing you've ever done in all your life? That is a hard question. But I think I think the most courageous thing that I have ever done is to trust God when I when I can't see what he's doing. And I don't I don't think that's a courage that has come from myself. I think that God himself has allowed me the grace to continue to trust him. And I think that that's the most courageous thing that any of us can do is to continue to put our hope and our trust in God. Even when we don't really feel like it. And he he has showed me that that hope does not disappoint me. Because even when I don't get what I want, I get more of him. And I, I get to know him more. I get to know sides of him that I wouldn't have known if I hadn't scooted up next to him like that. So you're saying 
even if the olive tree is barren yeah, <laughs> and the yes. leaves are withering, to say, I'm still going to trust him. That's where real courage comes. I think that that is real courage. Mm-hmm. And as you were talking, I couldn't help but think of this passage in Romans chapter 5. Mm, I love this one. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Mm-hmm. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Mm-hmm. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Yes. God in you, mm-hmm. changing you. Yes. Great answer to the question. Thanks. Well, and there's a lot of courage that shows up in the book that you've written called Daring to Hope. It's a book that tells the story of how God has uh, been with you in the midst of suffering how you've seen his goodness in the brokenness of where you live and work. And uh, I would encourage our listeners, get a copy of Katie's book, Daring to Hope. You can order it from us online at familylifetoday.com, or you can call to order at 1-800-358-6329. That's 1-800-F as in family, L as in life, and then the word today. You know, one of the things that Dennis, both you and I love to hear our stories of of redemption, people whose lives were broken, headed in the wrong direction. They were in the ditch, as you like to say, and God intervenes and turns them in a new direction and points them in a new direction, turns their whole life around. Uh, recently, we got a chance to meet with a number of listeners who said, Family Life Today was a part of their redemption story. And uh, some of the stories we heard were just remarkable. And I, I was sitting there thinking, I wish our legacy partners, I wish the folks who help support this ministry could be here with us hearing these stories, because that's what you're giving to when you support the ministry of Family Life Today. You're helping us reach more people more regularly with practical biblical help and hope. And here as 2017 is drawing to a close, I know some of you are thinking about possible year-end donations to ministries like ours, and there's a special opportunity for you to give over the next couple of weeks. It's a matching gift fund that's been established for this ministry, and Michelle Hill is here with details on how we're doing with that matching gift fund. Hi, Michelle. Hey, Bob. Well, by now, many folks have heard that the match fund has more than doubled. It's now $4.3 million. But the real important number is one, as in that one person listening right now and deciding to give. And maybe you're that one. I mean, really, Bob, the match is going to be met one gift at a time. And so far, over 5,000 people have made that decision. So thanks to each one, like Don from Canton, Ohio. Today, we're at $971,000, which is great. But if we're going to take full advantage of the match, we'll need a lot of other ones to pray and then give as God leads. Well, and if you'd like to be a part of helping us uh, take full advantage of the matching gift, you can make a donation today online at familylifetoday.com or call to donate 1-800-358-6329 is the number, 1-800-F as in family, L as in life, and then the word today. Or you can mail your donation to Family Life Today at Box 7111, Little Rock, Arkansas. Our zip code is 72223. And if you haven't sent us a Christmas card yet, send a Christmas card and just tuck something inside, okay? And I hope you can join us back again tomorrow when we're going to hear a conversation we had not long ago with our friends Don and Sally Meredith. This is a remarkable couple who God used in a significant way to help birth the ministry of family life all the way back in 1976. So I hope you can tune in and meet our friends Don and Sally Meredith. I want to thank our engineer today, Keith Lynch. Along with our entire broadcast production team, on behalf of our host, Dennis Rainey, I'm Bob Lapine. We'll see you back next time for another edition of Family Life Today. Family Life Today is a production of Family Life of Little Rock, Arkansas. Help for today. Hope for tomorrow.